Good morning, Center for Spiritual Living, Capistrano Valley. How are you today? Well, not all experiences that we have on this physical plane are comfortable, are they? In fact, we might find ourselves in uncomfortable, disconcerting circumstances more often than we would like. Well, today we're going to take a closer look at that with our topic, leaning into discomfort. Leaning into discomfort. Now, why would I want to do that if I could avoid it? Good question. Good question. You know, we grow up learning to avoid pain and discomfort at all costs. Probably why there are so many drugstores everywhere you look. We medicate our discomfort so that we don't have to feel it. We would do anything to avoid, you know, pain and numb it. Avoiding pain seems like a no brainer. It seems like the best choice, our only option. That's what we've always done. That's the only response that we know. That's you know, uh, the only response that we think that there could be. And it's not until we learn a different strategy, a new way to think about this, can our responses change. So we're going to look at what is uncomfortable and a different way of reacting to it because running from or avoiding the uncomfortable situation and experiences doesn't really give us the long-term results that we want. That's really the reason why we're taking a look at this. It doesn't give us the long-term results. Short-term, maybe, yes. Long-term, not. Doing things the same way that we've always done them before guarantees that we will continue to find ourselves in situations where we are powerless to do anything about them. They just are in our face. They're in our life. We can't get rid of them. That is not a sustainable strategy for life, even though we've done it that way. And we are the ones who keep taking the hits not good for us at all. Unresolved issues continue to build in us and contribute to the underlying stress and unease that we often feel and the many health issues that we experience. This past week, a younger friend of mine called me very, very upset. A customer came on to her while she was working at a huge store that we all know. And he told her that he was going to take her to dinner and that he wanted a hug. Now she is fairly new in the work world. She's fairly new in this position as a checkout person. And after years of, um, you know, raising her son and taking care of her sickly mother-in-law, she's ventured out. So even so, she's no lightweight. She was a juvenile probation officer for 10 years prior to having her son. She grew up a tomboy with brothers. She still is kind of a tomboy. That's not going to happen, she told him. That's not going to happen. Still, before she could stop it, in a public place, he managed to slip in a quick side hug, which left her furious to say the least. By the time that she got to me a couple days later, after trying to process all of this on her own, shocked that it even happened, she said, I wasn't afraid. Kath, I wasn't afraid, but I am mad. His energy got into mine. And then she added, I should have known better than to let that happen. I calmly listened, asked questions, 
I did not want to add any fuel to this fire and make it worse. And finally, she was in a place where she could think straight and ask me what I thought. I acknowledged her experience of being well-trained in her field to work with all kinds of people. Sounds like you were caught off guard, I said. She replied, I was. Then I asked her, and I just, just, just didn't ask her right away. I asked her, so who are you really mad at? My clue was when she said, I never should have let this happen. She admitted herself. So you're gonna have to forgive yourself. She was beating up on herself for what happened. Be kind and loving to yourself about this. You're in a new job. This is a big company. You are exposed to many, many more people than you've ever been before. Many different kinds of people. I took it a step further. Let's look at him as a teacher. I dared to say, half waiting for her to object. She did not. She wanted to know more. Well, he helped you see that you have to be more prepared when you go out into the world mentally, emotionally, spiritually. You have to be in a good, strong, solid place with yourself. The world is going to do what the world is going to do. There are people all over the place with different levels of development and degrees of mental health. We have to take care of ourselves. I pushed her even further because I know she's tough. She is spiritually strong. We've been doing this together for many, many years. After you forgive yourself, then you're going to have to forgive him and eventually find a place of love for him. Now, most people would not be ready to go there so quickly but she got it. She ended with, I know what to do. She knew what to do. Now, what that was all about for her, I have no idea, but this is what we had to work with. This was what we had. What I do know is, is that if we continue to insist on the world doing something, whatever it is, to us, instead of creating what we want to see and experience from the inside, we will stay victims. And we won't get to that place of knowing ourselves as a higher order of being, the higher order of being that we came here to be, and what our lives could look like from that place. Oh, wow. What could it look like from that place? And how does it feel? to know who we are. Now, of course, we must continue to make choices, better choices for ourselves and be aware of what's going on around us. But we can't make enough ch changes to that, those outer conditions of life to keep us from experiencing something uncomfortable. We cannot, at least from that place. We cannot change the outer and expect it to stay put. It's a moving target, so to speak. We can't avoid every place we ever had a negative experience in or every person that we've ever had an experience, a negative experience with. We can't move enough or change jobs because of something that might uncomfortable that might've happened. That's not what this is about. That's not what life is about. That's not what this, what we're supposed to get. It's about us being prepared to go wherever we go, wherever we want to go as conscious, loving, centered beings, knowing who we are as spirit and seeing everyone else as spirit too. That's how we change the world. 
we carry that healing presence with us and it radiates. It uplifts everyone without us saying a word. You know, in the Abraham teaching, they say, if we were in your physical shoes, we would not start our cars without setting an intention to safely arrive at our destination, to easily find our way, to be surrounded by courteous drivers, or whatever else you might add. What they're saying is, is they wouldn't just go out there unprepared. They would, they, and just take it as it comes. That's not a strategy. That's not a successful strategy for living. That's the kind of preparation that we can and need to be doing. We set the tone. We have to take ownership of our lives and how we want them to be lived, how that we want them to play out. We live in an inside out world, not an outside in world. We do not live by default. What is normal or at an average life experience is not necessarily good. It's not good enough for us. We can expect more, much, much more. We don't accept things as they are. We create things the way we want to see them by declaring the greater truth for all. De great, de declaring the greater truth for all will reveal a higher order of being in us all. It reminds me of the Peace pro, uh, Pilgrim. If you haven't re uh, heard that story, look it up. There was someone that was following her and that she felt meant harm to her. And she took him under her wing as her protector. She said, I need someone who will take, you know, take, you know, make sure that I stay safe. And this guy became her, her guardian, her protector. He transformed because of the way that she treated him. She knew what, what, what he was about originally, but she looked further. It's a great story. It's, a, it's, a, it's just an amazing story. Declaring the greater truth for all will reveal the higher order of being in us all. Declaring health, mental health, let's just say, since that seems to be the big thing. Declaring mental health, for example, will draw forth greater mental health everywhere we look. And that is what we will see and experience. Healthy-minded people. That will be what draws forth and presents itself to us. No one's energy can get into ours unless we allow it. If we are prepared, we get to experience a whole other world. Things may be happening all around us. There's different worlds going on at the same time in the same space, but we are not a part of them in the same way because we are focused on seeing only the good. Life supports us in reflecting what we see in our minds and feel in our hearts. We need to go to a place of love and forgive ourselves when we are not in that place with ourselves and with those who have offended us. Nothing can harm us. We are invincible spirit, invincible spirit. So when we experience something comfortable, first we have to face our reactions, what happened, lean into what it's really about for us. Second, love and forgive ourselves. Life is an experiment. We aren't always gonna get it right. No blame or shame when we don't. We just decide to do it different next time. Fine tune as we go, take it to another level to the best that we can. And third, when we're ready, complete the exchange from start to finish with love and forgiveness for ourselves and for the others involved who offended us. Set them free in our minds. We may never know what that did for them. That's not our concern. Ours is to free ourselves as best 
as we can. Carl Jung, Jung the famous psychiatrist and uh, psychoanalyst, wrote something interesting while observing himself. And this is what he said. He said, at the beginning of the illness, I had the feeling that there was something wrong with my attitude and that I was to some extent responsible for the mishap. But when one follows the path of individuation, when one lives one's own life, one must take mistakes into the bargain. Life would not be complete without them. There is no guarantee, not for a single moment, that we will not fall into error or stumble into deadly peril. We may think there is a sure road, but that would be the road of death. Then nothing happens any longer, at any rate, not the right things. Anyone who takes the sure road is as good as dead. It was only after the illness that I understood how important it is to affirm one's own destiny. In this way, we forge an ego that does not break down when incomprehensible things happen. An ego that endures, that endures the truth and that is capable of coping with the world and with fate. Then to experience defeat is also to experience victory. Nothing is disturbed, neither inwardly or outwardly, for one's own continuity has withstood the current of life and of time. But that can come to pass only when does not, one does not meddle inquisitively with the workings of fate. Don't you love it? Things are going to happen. Forge an ego that does not break down when incomprehensible things happen. An ego that endures, that endures the truth and that is capable of coping with the world and with fate. Then to experience defeat is also to experience victory. Hmm. A lot to think about there. A lot of good stuff. Okay, so here's one of my own personal stories about leaning into discomfort. Many of you know and have heard my husband John and I moved to Atlanta after stepping down from our center of 25 years to be with my cousin, an eccentric, intelligent, fun, loving character. Character describes him who was having memory issues. He was a special ed professor in his day, traveled the world, well-versed, just highly intelligent. He wasn't quite the same after his companion of 15 years passed away about five years prior to this. Somewhere along the line in our relationship, he asked me if I would help him with his end of life affairs. His sister lived in Missouri, she was far off, and really I was the closest relative to him in that we shared the same philosophy and way of life. I could not refuse him. Of course, I said yes. After all, he saved my life when he introduced me to the science of mind 35 years ago. Now, John and I were quite exhausted after our 25 year commitment to serving others and we're desperately looking forward to a break even though we didn't know what that looked like now right about that same time it looked like things were going downhill more quickly for my cousin he still managed to live quite independently really all the way up until the end but now he seemed like he could use a little bit more support. I did not want to move back to Atlanta. I did not. My heart was yearning to move to the Pacific Northwest where we could explore in nature and be with our two sons in the area. I felt like I needed uh, 
significant amounts of being in the woods to restore my soul. And I remember saying to him, do you think we can work together on this long distance if we don't choose to move back? Graciously, he said, yes. But I knew that wasn't going to cut it. He had already begun to reach out to people he hardly knew, asking them for help. And what could I do living across the country? We had already been exchanging phone calls regularly from the start. Atlanta had grown tremendously in the last quarter of a century while we were gone. It was huge when we left. My cousin lived in Midtown. I never lived in the city before. It felt like lots of change would be necessary, more than I had the energy for. It meant we had to help sell our house move away from friends and family who were mostly part of our center. And just when we needed a rest, a break, here comes another big project. It seemed right, it seemed like the right thing to do, but it did not feel good. And my loving husband was right there with me. What a good man he has been to stand by my side from the beginning and jump in to help wherever is needed. We soon figured out that we really weren't ready to make the big move across the country. We didn't really have the energy for that either yet. And if we stayed in the area, people would continue to call us and never transition to the new minister and we were needed. This was a person who had made it all possible for me, including the demonstration of John 31 years ago. Everything I know and love began with my cousin. So we decided to go for it. And for convenience sake, we took a small, uh, rented a small place across the street from him, never really thinking things were going to happen so quickly. We were prepared to stay five to eight years if necessary, maybe take him with us at some point and go where we wanted to go when we were ready. Within a year, he was gone. And it wasn't COVID. We're not gonna blame the virus for everything that ever happened. And what felt like a major inconvenience at the onset became a new adventure. We rested, we recovered, we enjoyed him living in the city where all the action is, revisiting where we met, it was fun and good, not always easy, but we had together. We were, we, we, had, we were in this together and we took it on together. I made a list at one point and uncovered 20 reasons why this really was the right thing to do and how much we benefited from it. One of those benefits turned out to be days after he passed. His sister, who is also my cousin, who I barely knew before now, inherited his fortune. And she said to me, he would want you to have his house. He would want you to have his house. A turn of the century craftsman built house. Yes, a house. It needed a lot of work, but it was still worth something. Yes, this major detour checked so many boxes. I had to get into alignment with it before it could really show up as what it really was. Once we leaned into the discomfort of it, we could be happy and little did we know at the time. This detour would give us the means to make the move we really wanted to make with greater ease, with greater ease. Leaning into the discomfort, you never know where it's going to take you. Whether we encounter something more traumatic, taking us by surprise, like my friend did, or at least her initial reaction to it, 
or it shows up in small discomforts that we tolerate or we put them on the back burner to deal with someday. Leaning into the discomfort of whatever it is, is our path to freedom. Leaning into discomfort is, the path, is our path to freedom. It will take us ultimately where we want to go. This week, I want you to think about a time when you leaned into discomfort and where that led you. Our affirmation today is I lean into discomfort and allow it to teach me. Repeat after me. I lean into discomfort and allow it to teach me. We have awakened to our spiritual magnificence and it is wonderful. And so are you and so am I. Namaste.